But what about those of us with husbands that are unbelievers, or maybe they profess to believe in Jesus, but you don't see that fruit in their lives. This can be one of the most difficult topics that I think as women, sometimes we're kind of even ashamed to bring up, even with our Christian friends. But this for me, after years upon years upon years of an unbelieving spouse, a man who would say he was a Christian, but there was no fruit of it in his life, this was the single most thing that actually impacted our marriage, impacted him, his relationship with the Lord. And I say this now on the other side of it, because my husband's a pastor. And I never would have thought in a million years that that would ever be something he would ever entertain. And yet he now gives his life for that calling. So what did I do? What was that like one factor that made all the difference? For us, it was this. sweet friends i'm heidi with heavenly minded home and welcome back to our channel now i love sharing with you guys in these videos each and every single day yes literally a video comes out every single day around here as we share on topics that are my my prayer that they will be things that will encourage and equip you as a christian sister to truly grow and invest in eternity because that's what it's all about. It's living heavenly minded to the utmost earthly good. And I know that one of these kind of difficult topics that I get it, many of us, we don't want to talk about. We don't know how to talk about it. You don't see a lot of people out there talking about this. And the ones that do are usually kind of sugar-coated. Let's just be honest. But what about when your spouse isn't a believer? What about when maybe your husband says he's a believer, but you're not seeing that fruit? What do we do? How do we deal with this? And I think that in a church that is widely failing across the board with so much nonsense, false teachers abound, there's so much division out there within the body. I mean, so many difficult topics that we can talk about, but when you're dealing with this in your marriage, and we live in the day and age that we do, it can be so difficult to even know where to get help with this, let alone to actually be able to do it. And I am going to share a little bit about my backstory so you guys know why I'm saying this. And then I wanna share with you guys the single most impactful thing to happen to our marriage, to happen to our relationship, to get us to this point where my husband is now a pastor, leading a church, devoting his life to this, which I never in a million years, we've been a couple since I was 14 years old, okay? Never in a million years would have I ever even thought he would do anything remotely close to coming in contact with a church, let alone creating and leading a church. So let's go ahead and just 
I didn't even bring notes. I've got no fancy anything. It's just beautiful outside. And I said, you know, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to chit chat with y'all because I've been wanting to do this video, wanting to talk about this in just a very real, raw, and honest way. So if you want to grab a cup of tea, pour a cup of coffee, whatever, come sit down and chat with me because I think it's high time that we just have an honest conversation about this, that we're just transparent and we talk about it and say, as Bible believing wives, what do we do? How do we deal with this? Men are hardly even in the church anymore today. They're, they're nowhere to be found. Biblical men are missing from the landscape. That means most of us are probably dealing with a husband who isn't leading like Christ has called the men to. Maybe you do, and that's amazing. Praise God. But the majority of us, that's probably not where we're at. So what do we do about that? Well, I'm going to tell you what happened to us, and I'm going to tell you what I, what I know worked for us and what I truly believe will work for you as well. All right, so a quick little recap just to let you all know who we are so that way you know that what I'm getting ready to say is quite literally what we've walked through. My husband and I began dating when I was only 14. He was 17. We went to school together. We met in Christian school, both grew up in Christian homes, all the churches, all the things, you name it, we were there. Um, we started dating. We dated for um, a little over three years before I found myself pregnant. Um, I talked about it in a video a little while ago, but found myself pregnant, didn't know what to do. Um, eventually ended up telling him about it. And um, shortly thereafter, we ended up getting married in the middle of the week. We drove over to Vegas. We're from Southern California originally, got married. And um, on my 18th birthday, we ended up moving into our first home. We lived there for a few years um, as we were raising our, you know, now our little boy and trying to figure out what being adults was, what being a married couple was, what being parents was, what dealing with all of those things, trying to figure out all those pieces. It was quite honestly a disaster, but we really struggled. It came to a point where it got so bad that I said, we're leaving this little town a bit. We're trapped in. Everyone here is toxic. Like we cannot take this anymore. We have to do something with our lives. We have this child. Like we have to do something better than this pit of a town that we lived in. And our answer to that was to move to the other side of the country. And, you know, it was kind of one of those, like, what would your dream job be? And my husband was like, well, I'd be involved in NASCAR. We were really big race fans. And I said, sure, well, then we'll move across the country and we'll get involved with NASCAR. And so that's what we did. But the point in all of this, you know, we come out here, we started chasing the corporate ladder, building all of the things we, you know, nicer homes, nicer developments, nicer communities, nicer, you know, chasing all the things that we thought we needed. And all the while throughout all of this, while I kept going to church and trying to do the things that I felt we needed to do as we were raising our son and then our daughter came along and, you know, I, I felt like there was something more to it. My husband fought deeper and deeper and deeper into this pit of honestly unbelief. He came to this point where he finally felt like, why would God want anything to do with him anyways? He really started walking away from everything altogether, even foundational core elements that he grew up with. And meanwhile, I tried everything under the sun to get my husband to come on the same page as me. Now, I'm not saying I was doing it correctly, but I was trying. I was trying out new churches. I was going to things. Sometimes I would force him along. Sometimes we would fight tooth and nail over it. Sometimes he would actually come along. And sometimes I would just give up and say, forget it. None of this is worth it. Kind of did a little bit of everything. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. But I kept trying to get him to come along and nothing seemed to work. Our marriage was disastrous. It had more problems than you could shake a stick at, but yet we kept on and kept going. We moved to location, right? We did all of these different things to try to help fix our problem, but none of it ever actually did because none of it ever actually addressed the root. And so we tried all of these different things. And then more than a decade down the road, yes, we had this huge moment, this huge, literal life changing moment when my husband came up to me and told me that he wanted to enroll in seminary. 
I kid you not, I looked at him and I said, sweetie, do you know what seminary is? Because I don't think that word means what you think it means. Now, again, we've been a couple since I was 14 and he was 17. We went to Christian schooling together. He would ditch Bible class nearly every day. And the ones he showed up for, he didn't pay any attention to. He was not the seminary type guy in any way, shape or form. I genuinely did not think he knew what the word meant, but sure enough, he knew what he was signing up for and he did sign up for seminary. He enrolled in a seminary because he simply wanted to learn. Now, fast forward all these years, he's a pastor. We started a church. He devotes his life. He's not perfect, right? None of us are perfect. I'm not saying that, but he truly does devote his life to learning, to growing, to teaching. And you never would have thought that knowing the man that he was. He was the most, just picture here, the most stereotypical like punk rock skater boy from Southern California. That was him. The life we used to live, the people we used to be, honestly, most of the things he talked me into <laughs> and the things that I got in trouble with, they came from him because he was that guy. But God. The redemption story here is so powerful. So, a guy like that, who has no interest in anything, now is a pastor living his life for the Lord, genuinely, what happened? All right, so hang with me, okay? Yada, 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 husband's an unbeliever, our marriage is a mess, we're constantly battling this. Y'all, I tried everything, genuinely. I would force him to church. You have to come do this. I would guilt trip him. I would get angry. I would pout. I, I would try everything under the sun to get him to church because clearly all those things I just lifted are wonderful ideas of how one, you know, comes to a true saving knowledge of Christ, but different topic. I tried everything to get him to come. I would force him to come and he would be miserable. We would have so many issues. We would have that car ride that you see people post memes about where we're like looking out opposite directions and not even talking to one another on the car ride to church. Like it was ridiculous. He would come to these churches and most of the time he would just find all of these things that were wrong with them. It's kind of funny because now being older and, you know, a little more spiritually mature and, and knowing these things a little more, a lot of his concerns he had were truly biblically wrong, but that's not why he was upset at them. He didn't have a problem because of a biblical issue. He had a problem because of a hardened heart issue. I would force him to come. That wouldn't work. We would fight about it. So often Sundays became that I would wake up very quietly, kind of like sneak out of the room, get the kids ready, take the kids off to church, not even say anything to him because it wasn't even worth the fight. And then when we got home from church, we kind of just act like nothing happened and go about our day. Again, not grounds for like great marriage, let alone spiritual walk with the Lord going on here. We kept running into all of these issues, all of these problems. And then what would really make it worse is when I would just give up. Honestly, fighting him just wasn't even worth it sometimes. And truly, this part of it was probably the most damaging because I would. I would give up. It wasn't worth the fight. It wasn't worth the argument to even have the conversation or get the, the rude remarks when I wouldn't partake in, you know, watching a movie or doing this. I no longer found that funny or listened to that music or whatever it was. I would get these little remarks. I would get these little comments. So often it was just easier to go along with whatever it was that he wanted to do and kind of take the whole faith part of life and put it on the back burner. Over the fights to drag him into church, the sneaking out without him, I think that was the most impactful, damaging side of things that happened. And again, this went on for far too long. So this is that thing, the single most thing that made a difference. It was a handful of years ago, I don't remember off the top of my head, probably about a decade ago, I finally said, enough. I had tried for a decade 
to get him to do something, to get him to be that Christian man that I knew I needed. And nothing I did of my own power, pouting, crying, prying, pulling, right? None of that made a difference. But finally I said, you know what, Lord, I've had enough. There's clearly no way that I can change him. Mind blowing, right? And I said, Lord, fine. He's going to do him. I I don't know. I I I don't know. I gave complete. It was the Lord had to just grind me down to nothingness to be like, would you please give this to me and get out of your own way? So I did. I said, all right, Lord, it's all you. I don't know what to do. I gave it all to the Lord. I said, I'm not going to make that my priority. My priority now is going to be my walk with the Lord. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. I'm going to prioritize this above everything. Now, I'm not going to like neglect my husband and my family, but my priority is going to be in my walk with the Lord. And I vowed to read the Bible cover to cover. For me, that was such a big thing. I had been told my whole life, the Bible says this, Jesus says this, right? All these things I said, so many things, but I never had read the whole thing for myself. And so I did. I got my Bible and every day I would come sit out with the kids while they were playing or while we were doing something and I would just read. And I truly stuck to it. And the more I read, the more I saw, I just had these like light bulb moments that went, what else could we think that means, right? Scripture is so clear. Scripture interprets scripture. Scripture is all we need. And as I was reading, I was like, this is mind blowing. It, it just, it says it, it's so clear. And I came across this passage in Peter, in 1 Peter, where he gives this instruction to us women and tells us that we could win an unbelieving spouse to Christ, not by forcing, not by nagging, not by guilt tripping, not by whining, not by beating, not by, you know, not by any of these other things, simply by our Christ-like conduct. Peter says that truly by our example, an unbelieving spouse can come to Christ and have true salvation in Jesus simply by the example that we put forth. I had never known that. There's so many women's things and and retreats and all these different things. And I'm like, why aren't we just focusing on this? What was so amazing that by this conduct, by my saying, you know what, God, you and him, that's you and him. I can't control him, but I do control me. So what kind of conduct am I displaying? Who am I? am I truly? Where's my relationship with the Lord? How am I living as a godly wife, even with an unbelieving spouse? Am I being a godly mother and setting that example? What am I doing? It meant that sometimes I towed the line and I said, I'm not watching that, or I'm not doing that, or I'm not partaking in that. I don't find that funny. That's not entertaining to me anymore. I'm not being a jerk or unkind about it, but I'm being honest and saying, I'm sorry, that just, that makes me feel really uncomfortable. And what's really amazing is that first, it made everything worse. Like, I know that this is the worst video to be putting out there on the internet, because I think this is why the popular people put out the real nice, like, lovey things and everything super fun and frilly and pretty. But the truth usually isn't that. The truth was that I finally had to say, I'm going to stick to it. I can't control him. I can only control me. And I'm going to give my all to being a new creation in Christ. And then things got bad. Because remember, friends, we don't fight against flesh and blood. It's the spiritual principalities. And Satan, if he's got his hooks in our spouses, 
He doesn't want to give them up. And so when we're coming along and we're just pouring this Christ-likeness before them, Satan is absolutely going to respond. And in our house, it, was, it wasn't fun. We really started to argue. We really started to fight. My husband made horrible comments to me. But I knew in those moments that it wasn't me he was attacking. And it wasn't even him. It was Satan's hook in him trying to drive him further and further away. And normally about that time, I would give up and say, whatever, it's not worth it. I'll just let it go and we'll go back to normal. Not this time. I kept at it. I kept reading. I kept praying. I kept being renewed and sanctified and changed through the spirit of the Lord. And the more I prioritized that and I grew in that, sure, As I'm growing, my husband is like, not happy, not happy, not happy, not happy. But I kept at it. And next thing I know, I'm telling you, out of nowhere it seemed, I started, I would share things with him like, wow, I read this today. Did you know that happened? Like, that's mind blowing. And so I kind of got some wheels turning. And then that fateful day happened where he came up and he said, I want to go to seminary. And genuinely, I asked him if he knew what the word meant because I didn't think he did. This guy, this guy that's been fighting me against all of this for all these years, wants to go to seminary? Truthfully, that's what happened. And it was absolutely mind-blowing that just what Peter wrote is exactly what happened. Now, I know some of you will be like, well, I've done this and my husband hasn't changed, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. Pause. Number one, have you truly given it to God? Like I said, for me, I, it, it was a, I was so worn down and fed up. I was like, fine, God, you have them. I can't do it anymore, okay? For me, it was that way. Have you truly given it to God? Step two would be, are you truly living for the Lord? Are you truly growing in your discipleship? Are you truly showing this Christ-like conduct? And the third would be, Your husband's life isn't over yet, and neither is yours, because you're here watching this video. You don't know when this time will come. I would argue and say that this process took far too long, right? Because it didn't just happen right away. But God's timing is perfect, and we don't know. You don't know if on your husband's deathbed, it might click. We don't know. We can't answer that. But we do know that God's word tells us that by our conduct, we can bring an unbelieving spouse to Christ. And it's not us who does it. It is the spirit. We're just a tool that is used. But that tells us all, all of us wives who have unbelieving spouses, or maybe your husband says he's a believer, but there's really no fruit there. Your conduct is important. Are you living for Christ? Are you truly prioritizing a life as Christ calls us to live? Are you growing in your spiritual maturity and your biblical literacy each and every day, genuinely? Does your husband see that in your life, your actions, your words, everything that you are? Because this really does have a lasting impact. And then my prayer for you would be, don't get discouraged. Because I get it. When it's not happening, you feel like it's never going to happen. And another year goes by, and another year goes by, and another year goes by, and it is difficult. But we do not know. Our conduct and our prayer is so important here for our husbands to truly come to that saving knowledge of Christ. And that was genuinely the single most impactful thing. And I know, again, this is like the worst thing to put out there because it's not this like shiny fun thing that we can package in a box and pass out. You doing your part, growing in the Lord, living this out, being prayerful, trusting the Lord and truly giving it to him. That's what we have to do. And every day that it takes, we keep giving it to God. 
because he's got it and he knows and our trust is in him. So ultimately, regardless, we know that we're investing in eternity with all of our actions and that God's got it and he's going to work it out between him and your husband. We're called to be here and to be shining that light, to be that conduct that shines in our home to our spouse that they will see and that they will truly be convicted, right? Convicted and respond to that conviction with repentance. Stop nagging him. Stop dragging him from church to church. Stop giving him attitude for all the things he's getting wrong. Stop being mad at him. Stop being hurt by him. Stop being angry with him. All of the ways that we give sass and attitude because we feel our husbands are subpar. And maybe they are, right? Sometimes they're in situations where they really are. But guess what? So are we. So we're called to be that example that Christ was to the world. To show our spouse by our conduct. To live these things out in accordance with biblical womanhood. And to trust that God's got it. And he knows what's best anyways. We're just here to be his ambassador. To be the body here today. And doing our part being used as vessels for the Lord. So I get it if you're struggling that it's tough. And I get wanting to give up. And being frustrated and thinking it's never going to happen. I get it. But God promises other wise in his word. And we would be wise to cling on to that. So friends, again, I understand that that's not the shiny little pretty box being passed out at the woman's retreat, but it's what really works. And I'm not the only one who's had this experience. There's many, many who have had the same. And there will continue to be many until the Lord comes. And so if this can be an encouragement to you today, to be that biblical example, to shine the light of truth, to live, let your conduct just pour out and be what shows your husband what a life for Christ truly looks like. Not nagging, not fussing, not guilt tripping, not holding all of his wrongs against him, truly loving him as Christ loved us, truly being there, to stand firm in the faith and be that godly conduct and example. And so hopefully this can be an encouragement to you. If you have any questions, if there's any specifics you guys would like to know, leave me a comment down below. We're happy to help. We're happy to answer. Not because our marriage is perfect or we have it all right or anything of the like, but because we truly love to serve you all in any way that the Lord will use us. And so if being an example, putting it out there, if that's something that can be a blessing, we're happy to do it. Hopefully this can give you a little bit of encouragement today and just know that genuinely, we're praying alongside of you all. Leave me a comment down below. I'd be happy to pray for you alongside of you with your marriage because I know it's difficult and I know how much it hurts and how frustrating it can be and downright vile it can get. I get it. It's difficult. But when we trust in the Lord to bring our spouse to a saving knowledge, the Lord is faithful. And hopefully this can be an encouragement to you all here today. I'm going to go get back inside and spend some time with my hubby and my kiddos. And I will see you all right back here tomorrow. Bye, friends.